Okay, thank you, uh, Theo, and thank you for all of you to be here with us today for this no webinar. Uh, so uh, the no webinar today, we will have the um, oops. we will have um, the work presented by two PhD students, then followed by five minutes of question. Then I will introduce Julie Kenning, who is a PI and will present her research. She does in Marseille. So the two PhD students are Florence Ricardi and Manon Chateau. So Florence uh, obtained a master degree in genetics in, uh, the, at the University of Paris Diderot in 2017. And now she does a PhD in human neurogenetics under the supervision of Laurent Villard in Marseille Medical Genetics. And in parallel, she has clinical activity in the Samus Hospital in Toulon. And her PhD focuses on the development of RNA interference therapy in key CNQ2 related developmental and epileptic encephalopathies. And Manon, she obtained a graduation at the Ecole Normale Supérieure of Paris-Saclay. Then she started a PhD at the Institut des Sciences du Mouvement Humain under the supervision of Josina de Graaf. And her research study the phantom and movement in transhumeral amputees, and she used MEG and fMRI technique. And her goal are to better understand the underlying sensory motor loop and why phantom movement are reported to be slow and to require demanded effort. So um, it's your time, um, Florence and Mano. Uh, good morning, everyone. So I'm going to present uh, Manon's. A PhD project about phantom limb and uh, the study of the sensory motor loop involved in phantom movements after transhumeral amputation. And uh, so to start, I wanted to say a few words about the concept of phantom limb, which was quite new for me. Uh, so um, first of all, it's a definition. So patients, um, um, it's a patient sensation in a limb that does not exist, that has been removed, in fact. And this concept have, have, has been described in the 29th century first by a surgeon uh, called Silas Ware Mitchell. And uh, it was the context of uh, the U.S. Civil War, uh, where um, uh, 30,000 um, limbs were removed uh, due to the use of firearms. So now in the 21st, 21st century, it's, it's quite different, but there is still a lot of patients suffering from uh, amputation, as, as you can see here, uh, around uh, approximately 60 million of people uh, has uh, an amputation and it, uh, it can be caused by traumatic causes as fall or um, road injuries or um, as uh, uh, this uh, young um, um, uh, male, uh, Théo Curin, uh, this young uh, um, uh, man has got uh, an infectious disease and uh, uh, named meningitis. Uh, which caused his, uh, his amputation. So uh, the phantom limb sensation uh, occurs in 80 to 100% uh, of amputees. So it's quite a large number of people. And it is a chronic cause, uh, often resistant to treatment. So um, what is Manon's uh, PhD project? So Manon Journée, as you said, uh, Pierre Yves uh, is a bachelor and master degree at uh, L'École Normale Supérieure de paris saclay She started PhD in uh, uh, 2019 uh, at uh, l'Institut des Sciences du Mouvement. And uh, she is studying uh, the sensory motor loop. Um, and uh, I wanted to say a few words about this. So the sensory motor loop, uh, is um, 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 controlling the movements. So he, this is the way uh, we use our uh, muscles. So there is a motor command uh, that guides uh, our uh, movements. And uh, to do this, uh, it is highly regulated by a lot of sensory feedbacks. And uh, the first uh, feedback is the visual one. Then there is a proprioceptive feedback. Uh, from the joints, uh, the stretch of the associated muscle and tendon, and uh, a proximity sensation uh, of the effector and the, uh, of the object. 
So uh, our work is based on um, um, a, an over previous PhD teamwork, uh, which has been based on um, uh, approximately 100 patient interviews and data collection using a very interesting tool called the Cyber Gloves. Uh, which uh, um, made the team able to quantify the phantom movement kinematics and relate this uh, to the intact link kinematics and to the time elapsed since amputation. So uh, the team demonstrated that uh, uh, phantom hand and wrist movement in the upper limb amputees are slow but naturally controlled movements. And uh, that's uh, why now uh, Manon is working and their objective is to explain so why uh, the phantom limb movement are slow or can have various speed of movements and uh, is based on an hypothesis that uh, there is a mismatch maybe between the motor command and the sensory feedback. So here you can see um, so the homunculus sensory and motor um, um, uh, representation. So uh, you start with uh, an idea of a motor command. So you want to move the phantom limb, uh, and then you uh, collect data on the uh, sensory and uh, muscle contraction uh, on the upper uh, limb, uh, which is left, and you uh, try to collect the data of the sensory uh, uh, cortex zone. So uh, she used some techniques as um, magnetoencephalography, called MEG, uh, which helps to map the brain activity by recording magnetic uh, fields produced by electric currents of the brain activity. So she, this helped to record the motor command and the sensory feedback on the brain. Uh, and uh, this is couple with a brain MRI in another step, not in the same time. And the MRI, the brain MRI helps to visualize the, the morphology and the specific brain region. And uh, in the same time of the magnetoencephalography, she uh, will perform, now she's performing electromyography uh, that uh, detects the electric potential generated by muscle cells when they are activated. And this, in um, the case of our project, helped to record the muscular peripheral movements, as you can see here on the picture. So what are the perspectives of her work? So as I said, uh, limb amputation concern quite a lot of people in the world. So there is a fundamental neuroscientific interest to better understand the physiopathology mechanism and the plasticity of the brain uh, due to this uh, severe injury. And also uh, there is a transnational uh, view because um, uh, this could help patient care and uh, improve the control of myoelectric prosthesis and facilitate rehabilitation of amputees and uh, also maybe reduce the phantom limb pain, which is well known by the, the public. So thank you, Manon, for your work. And uh, I wanted to show this very impressive uh, uh, book about this guy called uh, Aaron Ralston, which uh, who survives to a, a very severe accident by cutting off his right arm. And after the accident, he continue, uh, still continuing doing uh, monitoring and uh, hiking. So yeah. That's very incredible. Hello, everyone, and thank you to the team for the opportunity to participate in this uh, new webinar. Um, and thank you, Florence, for the exchange we had. Um, so I'm going to introduce you to Florence's project, uh, who's trying to find a therapeutic a solution for a disease that is called uh, KCNQ2 related developmental and epileptic encephalopathies. So these are the most severe and early forms of DEE. They are due to um, de novo mutations. Uh, it means that it's not inherited by parents in KCNQ2 gene. It's uh, associated with numerous and severe seizures that are drug resistant, but most importantly, it, it leads to a significant developmental delay. So here you have a patient of a few years old. He can't hold his head. He can't uh, properly use his hands and he's never gonna be able to walk or speak. 
So to sum up, DE is a genetic disease that can't be predicted because it's due to a de novo mutation and it leads to severe developmental delays and early death. So the gene that is mutated in these cases is a gene that codes for a subunit of potassium channel uh, that is here in, in green. Um, it's expressed in neurons and uh, most importantly in axon initial segments. It can combine with, with itself or other kind of subunits to form a four subunit uh, potassium channel that is called KV7. It has an important function in the, in the brain. Uh, it's a voltage dependent potassium channel that is involved in spike after hyperpolarization, also called a refractory period. So it's the period during which another pot action potential can't happen. And because of this, it regulates neuronal excitability and stabilizes the membrane potential. So if you get mutations in the gene, you will get uh, an, um, an altered function, uh, an altered uh, neuronal excitability, etc. So this is DE, but there's another phenotype that is also due to uh, uh, um, other uh, mutations in the same gene. And this is called BFNE. Um, you also have um, uh, uh, epileptic seizures during infancy. But the good thing is that the kid is then going to have a normal development. So Florence's goal is to go from <clears throat> DEE to BFNE. With BFNE, everything comes from um, an inherited nonsense mutation. And so a nonsense mutation will lead to a truncated protein. And because it's a truncated protein, it's not going to be able to combine with other um, subunits. So it's not going to have any effect on KV7 because it's not going to form any KV7 uh, channel. And you will be left with only 50% uh, functional KV7 um, uh, channel. So all you have is KV, uh, channels that, KV7 channels that function normally, but 50% is not sufficient to maintain the white type phenotype. This is called haploinsufficiency. In the case of DEE, on the contrary, you have 50% mutated KV7.2. And because it's going to combine with the white type uh, subunit, you will have many, many KV7 channels that uh, will have a different function and is going to lead to, uh, to this phenotype. It's because there is an, what is called a dominant negative effect. It means that you only need one mutant subunit to have an altered function of the whole channel. So in the end, Florence um, is going to uh, suppress this mutated protein so that we are back to the haploinsufficiency situation. So how is she going to do that? Well, she designed a small interference RNA that are going to target the mutated KCNQ2. So they are speci specifically uh, targeted the messenger RNA of the mutant. And um, this process uh, will allow to cut the mutant messenger RNA into small um, pieces. And then she has to test the efficacy. So first is the technical efficacy. Um, using this small interference RNA, is it going to reduce the quantity of the mutant protein? And then is it going to change the behavior 
and the electrical properties of neurons in knocking mice. Uh, and for that, she's working with another lab that is doing patch clump and MEA. Thank you very much. So now we have uh, the pleasure to have Julie Koenig Gambini, who is presenting her research. So Julie has met the conference at Ex Marseille University, and she does her research at InMed in the team of Jerome Epstein. So since her PhD, her research focused on spatial cognition. And during her PhD, she studied the involvement of the medial septum in the brain processing of spatial information. And then she learned in vivo electrophysiology techniques to record grid cell, play cell, and eduction cells that are neuron fundamental to understand how the brain form representation of space. So she went to Ledgeb Lab in San Diego and Sebastian Royer Lab in Seoul. And she now studies how play cell integrate two streams of information, external landmark and internal cues. And Julie and the, the team in 2019 published the first French paper using virtual reality in rodents. And they show that the hippocampal spatial representation is not homogeneous, but the resolution of this representation uh, could be increased locally in area uh, which in proximal visual cues. Okay, so thank you very much for the invitation. I'm very happy to be here to talk about uh, like the last project that uh, is pretty much almost done in the team. So this figure pretty much illustrates what I'm going to talk about. So here you have a rat that is leaving its nest and it is foraging for food until it finds some some cheese sorry and uh, today and uh, actually at each position in this trajectory the animal is able to compute its distance and direction from the starting point and today i will present some brain mechanisms that enable the computation of this type of uh, of, of of this distance Okay, so mammals can use a spatial representation of their environment to navigate. This spatial representation is also called a cognitive map. So this map contains knowledge about the spatial configuration of the different elements in the environment. For example, the position of the flower field in comparison to this tree. And you need at least two streams of information to build this map. First, obviously, you will need information coming from the environment, and they are called allothetic information, for example, coming from vision. But as you move in the environment, there is uh, information that are generated during self-motion, and they are called idiothetic information. So coming from optic flow, proprioception, vestibular vestibular system. So these idiotetic information are going to be important to perform path integration. And path integration can, uh, uh, is, is going to be essential to compute this vector pointing, so from the, the position of the, of the animal here, the cheese, to the starting point. Beyond this mechanism, path integration might be very essential to generate the metric information of the map. So information about direction and also distance. So in the brain, you have uh, one uh, structure that is very important for uh, uh, navigation using a cognitive map, and it's the hippocampus. So in the hippocampus, you will find neurons called place cells that fire when the animal is in a specific location in the environment. So here you have one example. So it's one play cell recorded while the rat was foraging for food in a square box. So in gray, it's the trajectory of the animal. And every red dot is an action potential that is emitted by this neuron. This is a firing weight map. So it indicates 
the firing weight of the cell at each location uh, of, uh, in the box. And the color codes for the intensity of the firing weight. And you can see that this cell is increasing its firing weight at this location, which is called the place field. So now we have many, many data showing that place cells can be driven by allothetic and or idiothetic cues. And one way to study that is to record place cells while rodents are running back and forth in a linear track. In this situation, you will find bidirectional place cells. So bidirectional place cells, they have a place field in both directions. So here you have an example. So this cell is firing here when the animal is going in this direction, and it's firing here when the animal is going in this direction. So the place field is located at the same position, so in com like in, uh, compared to the landmark in both directions. And this type of coding is called position coding. So, uh, uh, bidirectional place cells can also generate another type of coding called distance coding. And this has been described in uh, wardens uh, running back and forth in virtual linear track. I'm going to explain later a bit in more in detail uh, a virtual reality in wardens. But in this virtual linear track, bidirectional place cells, they tend to do distance coding. So here you have an example, and you see that the place field in both directions is not at the same position. But then if I align these two tracks to the starting point, like this, so starting point is here, you see that the place field is located at the same distance from the starting point, and we call that distance coding. And based on what I explained before, like, this, uh, like the fact that pass integration is important to compute in its, uh, its position in comparison to the starting point, we think that this distance coding might be a neural signature of pass integration uh, in the hippocampus. And we are interested to understand the uh, brain mechanisms that enable the neuronal network to produce this distance coding. Okay, so there is one type of cells that might be essential to compute distances. It's a grid cell in the enteranal cortex. So the medial enteranal cortex contains this type of uh, spatially modulated cells, and this cortex projects to the hippocampus. So this is the recording of one grid cell in the square box. And you can see that this one neuron so one cell has multiple fields in the environment, and they are organized as an hexagonal grid. That means that each field is located at the tip, it's the vertex actually, of an equilateral triangle that is repeated in the environment. So right now, most, the vast majority of computational models, they propose that grid cells are um, receiving information about speed and uh, direction to perform pass integration and that they, are, that they are essential to compute distances. You have also, now we have also very ni nice experimental evidence about this role of grid cells in distance computation. And actually some of, of this work, some very nice one were done by Pierre Jacob. Okay, so Based on what I explained before, if grid cells is, uh, is, uh, are essential to compute distances, maybe they are also essential to compute this distance coding that I've just uh, shown you in the hippocampus. And our goal was to, like, if this is correct, we can test that by an experiment. So one possibility is that is to test the effects of a manipulation that affects the grid cells firing pattern and to look whether this manipulation can affect distance coding in the hippocampus. So this is exactly what we have done. So of course you might think, but how can you affect grid cells firing pattern? 
So one possibility is to do an inactivation of the medial septum. So the medial septum is a very tiny nucleus that project to the hippocampus and to the uh, medial internal cortex. And medial septum is essential to generate a theta rhythm. So it's a, it's a rhythm that you find in the LFP, in the hippocampus and in the MEC, while the animal is moving in the environment. And it's uh, six to 10 hertz. And if you do a pharmacological inactivation of the medial septum, so you can use lidocaine, but you can use also mercimol, you see very clearly that the theta rhythm is almost completely gone, very, very reduced. So we showed in uh, 2011 that during medial septum inactivation, grid cells firing pattern are very, very affected. So here you have two grid cells recorded before the medial septum inactivation. And here you have the same one recorded during the medial septum inactivation. And you can see that the grid pattern here and here is completely gone. And very interestingly, if you look at play cells, medial septum inactivation do not affect the spatial modulation of play cells. So here you have two examples. So as in grid cells, the firing rate is reduced. So they fire less, but when they fire, they fire at the right spot. So the similar spot than before. So here we have a manipulation that affects grid cells firing pattern, but not the spatial modulation of play cells. And our goal was to test whether this uh, medial septum inactivation can affect the distance coding that I've described in hippocampus. And we expect to see an alteration. OK, so now, I don't know why it's always take time for this slide. It's going to go. OK, so this is the virtual reality setup for mice that we are using. So you have a mice here that is head fixed, sitting on a wheel surrounded by screens that project the virtual environment. The movement of the animal on the wheel are coupled to the movement uh, in the virtual environment. And during behavior, we can record the activity of uh, hippocampal neurons, so during behavior. OK, so the, the first thing that we did is that we, can, we wanted basically to find a, an experimental condition where distance coding was the best. So we compared uh, uh, hippocampal neurons in two conditions. So these conditions were always a linear track. And the task of the animal was to run back and forth, so between the end extremities, where a water reward was distributed. And of course, you might think that your animal is at fix. He cannot turn. Yes, he cannot turn. And so when it reached the end, of the track, it was teleported at the same location, but with the track rotated by 180 degrees so that it's facing uh, the other direction. So basically, we uh, compared play cells, like play cells activity between two groups of mice. Some mice were trained in this linear track deprived of proximal visual cues. It's an empty, it's an empty track. And some mice were trained in the same maze, but we just added two proximal visual, visual uh, cues. So they are actually 3D objects that you can see here, like this origami, and here this cube. So I'm just going to show you um, a brief video of the behavior of the animal. So it's actually not one track that we, you, we have used in this experiment, but it's just to give you an idea of what's going on uh, during a virtual reality in rodents. And actually here on the video, we are recording in the hippocampus. So let's start. So you have the mice. Here is the leak port. So the wheel, the mice is running. It switched the end. And then the leak sport is advancing and, the, and the, a reward is distributed. And so here we are recording. You don't see the probe because you have the Faraday cage and like this tape. So now the, the animal is facing the other direction and he is uh, continuing his journey. 
and so on. And it can show you everything. I think you have the idea. Okay. So first thing, we looked at bidirectional play cells recorded. So in the two conditions, the condition without object, track without object, and track with objects. So here you have all the bidirectional cells that were recorded in the track without objects. So this is a firing rate map in one direction and in the other direction. And one line is a firing, the mean firing rate at each position for one bidirection cell. So in one direction and in the other direction. And you see that the firing rate map in one direction is the mirror image of the firing rate map in the other direction. That means that pretty much in this condition, all bidirectional cells are coding for distance. So their place field, for example, here, is located at the same distance from the starting point. Things were quite different in the group of mice so trained on the track with object and recorded in that track. We don't see anymore this very nice diagonal. It seems that we have a mix between position coding and distance coding. So to quantify this, we calculated a distance and position index. So first the distance index. So here you have a nice bidirectional play cells. So it is uh, the forward trial, the backward trial. This cell is actually doing very strong distance coding. You can see that if I align these two firing rate map to the starting point. Then to compute the distance index, we calculated the distance, so D1, D2, between the starting point and the, uh, the peak of the field. Then we use this nice formula. And basically this idea is that if here you have a complete overlap between the two fields, your distance index is going to be uh, equal to one, like perfect distance coding. If the, uh, this index is equal to zero, that means that here you have a distance between the peak that is equal to half of the maze, which is, uh, which is uh, 80 centimeters. So for the position index, it's exactly the same idea, except that when we overlap these two firing rate map in both direction, we align the firing rate map to the landmarks. Oh, and it's the same idea. Okay, so first we showed that the distance index is much better in the track uh, without objects. Like in th these are the value for the, the distance index for the track without object. And we see that we are pretty close to one and pretty much all of them. So you have a score that is higher than 0 0.5. Uh, the position index, that was exactly the opposite. Position index was much better in the track and reached with two objects. And then here, if I plot the distance index against the position index in the track without objects, I can, we consider this population of cells. So they have a distance index that is higher than 0 0.5 and a position index that is lower than 0 0.5 this uh, green box, we consider these cells are per, uh, as doing distance coding, like they have a pretty good uh, distance coding. And in the track without object is like 90% of the cell, most of them are coding for distance. In the track with object, uh, like the bidirectional cells pretty much split in two population. Some are doing distance, in, uh, distance coding and some are coding for the position. Okay, so now we have a very nice condition, which is the track without object in which the distance coding is pretty strong. So we choose to test whether an inactivation of the middle septum can affect this distance coding. So first we recorded the cells uh, normally in the, in the familiar track, in the back and forth stacks. Then we infuse maximal in the middle septum to inactivate this structure. And we put the animal back in the track so that he can do more trials. 
So first, it was very important to make sure that the theta is uh, very reduced because if you want to affect the grid firing pattern, you need a very strong reduction of theta. So this is a spectrogram, so between zero to 20 Hertz, so showing the power in the different frequency bands before the inactivation, and this is during the inactivation. And you see that this nice theta band around seven Hertz is completely gone during the medial septum inactivation. So we quantify for that, we calculated the theta attenuation, so due to the, uh, to the infusion in the medial septum. And we compare that uh, between two groups, one group that was infused with Mercibol, so the medial septum was inactivated. And here you see that the theta attenuation is very strong, like around 95%. And we compare that with control mice that were injected with ACSF, so artificial cerebrospinal fluid. Okay, so next we also uh, look at any effect of media septum inactivation on behavior. So here is the, uh, the mean speed at each position in the track, so between the starting point and the reward. In black, uh, this is before the inactivation. In red, this is during the inactivation. And we notice that during the inactivation, the animal, they tend to decelerate later. And so to quantify for that, we compute the slope of the last deceleration period before the reward. And you can see here in this, uh, uh, so this is one session. In this session, very clearly that under maximal inactivation, the slope is steeper. So they decelerate, uh, they start the deceleration later than before. So this is for all the trial of all the recording session and uh, this difference was significant. Slopes were steeper under medial septum inactivation. Of course, the big question is what's going on with the bidirectional play cells. So you can see it by eye, actually. This is the, the bidirectional play cells recorded before the inactivation, and this is during. So we have a very drastic reduction in the number of bidirectional play cells. So to quantify it, we first calculated the percentage of play cells that are bidirectional cells. Because one thing that I didn't say is that in linear track, play cells have two possibilities. Either they, they, are, they have a place field in both directions, so bidirectional cells, or they can be unidirectional. Unidirectional means that they have a place field only in one direction. And you see that the percentage of bidirectional cells dropped so, uh, in before in comparison to after the merciful infusion. Okay, so next. Another thing that we uh, were interested to quantify is that here you have the bidirectional cells that remain, so the sixth one. And they are a bit different from this one. Like uh, this is before the medial septum inactivation. We have some distance coding in the middle of, of the track. And, but we lose almost completely the, the bidirectional cells that are coding in the middle of the track. So to quantify that, we wanted to have a measure of distance coding at every location on the track. So we, you can per, we perform a population vector analysis. So here, this, this little uh, rectangle show you one vector of activity. So the, 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 uh, an, an activity vector measuring the activity of all these bidirectional cells in this position. And we compare this vector with all the different vectors in the other direction. So all different possibilities back and forth. So if you do that, I'm just gonna remove that. If you do that, you have these correlation matrices. So this correlation matrices basically indicate uh, the correlation between two pairs of firing rate uh, vector at each, uh, at, uh, in each, at each, for each possibility. So this is the uh, forward trial, and this is the starting point, and this is the backward trial, and this is the starting point. 
And you see that you, we have a nice here um, diagonal, which is yellow and indicate high correlation. And this actually show a, a nice distance coding at every location on the track. And if we compare this correlation matrix to the one under Merciful, you see that. So basically we lose all this good distance coding in the middle of the track. And this is actually consistent with a pass integration deficit because pass integration, the pass integrator accumulates error uh, the farther you go. Okay, another thing. I don't think if you remember, but I told you in the introduction that during an, uh, an inactivation of the medial septum, you have a, a decrease of the firing rate of, uh, of the cells. So you might think, yeah, maybe you would use this reduction in the number of bidirectional cells is explained by a reduction in the firing rate. So to look for that, we look at unidirectional place cells. So the one that, that fire only in one direction. So this, this is the unidirectional cells before, during the inactivation. So we have a, a bit, we lost a little bit of them, like 20% uh, approximately, but this loss is nothing to compare with the loss we have uh, uh, with the bidirectional cells. So to quantify it, we, we did this calculation that is actually very simple to understand. So for each cell category, unidirectional, bidirectional, we calculated the number of the, so the relative change is the number of, cell, of cells after minus the number of cells before divided by the number of cells before. So this is for the bidirectional place cells, this is the unidirectional place cells. For the bidirectional place cells, the relative change is close to minus one. So meaning that we lose almost all the cells and it's significantly different from zero. The unidirectional cells is not di significantly different for, from zero, so they don't change that much. And uh, this difference between the two is uh, significant. You have a third type of active cells uh, in this condition, the pride of objects is active cells that are non spatially modulated. And in this condition, we have actually quite a lot of, a lot of these cells. So we also looked for the relative change in the non spatially modulated cells. And you see that they didn't change. It's not significantly different from zero. OK, I'm almost done. And then we ask a, a, a last question. OK, under media septum inactivation, can by the distance coding is very affected. It seems that bidirectional places, they cannot anymore uh, uh, exhibit distance coding, but can they um, uh, generate position coding? So to do that, we add for some recording session, a third condition here. So here it's a new track with object. So two objects were added. Okay, so these are the animal infused with Merciable here. So reduction of bidirectional places in the track without object. I've already talked about it. And this is their activity in the track with objects. And you see that actually we increase the number and the cells, they fire in both directions close to the object. So suggesting that the position coding is actually very good. We compare that with animal infused with uh, ACSF. So basically the idea was to compare this condition in the track uh, with object with this condition. And here in the ACSF, we have something that really looks like what I've shown you at the beginning, uh, the weasel from the animal um, trained already in this condition. So here, basically, the idea is that under Merciful inactivation, position index is actually enhanced. Position index uh, is, uh, is better under Merciful inactivation than uh, in control animal ACSF. And for the distance index, it was the opposite. OK, so our hypothesis was we expected to see an alteration of distance coding in C1 during an activation of the media septum and it's exactly exactly what we had so such inactivation uh, reduce uh, the drastic reduction of theta oscillation and also we 
the number of bidirectional cells pretty much uh, dropped. And another thing is that distance coding was impaired at, uh, in the middle of the maze. And this is also consistent with an alteration of parcel uh, integration. And last thing is that position coding was actually better under media septum inactivation. And that might reveal some sort of competition between uh, in position coding and distance coding. Like if you remove the possibility to do distance coding, the animal is going to switch to position coding. Okay, so this, all the uh, experiments that I've shown you were performed by Mathilde Dordoum. So she's a PhD student in our lab. She's defending her thesis pretty soon. So that's a really outstanding work. It's uh, lasted five years and we are very happy about the results. So she did uh, like all the experiments, the analysis, everything. Also Jérôme Epstein, so he's the team director and he was co-supervising this work. Uh, Romain Bourboulou and Geoffrey Marty. So jo Romain Bourboulou was a former PhD in our lab and Geoffrey Marty a former postdoc. Romain actually started this work and we are still using lots of their code to analyze uh, our results. Also, we have a collaboration with, uh, Nicola, with Hervé Rouault. Uh, thanks to Nicolas Levernier, he's a postdoc in our team, but also in the team of Hervé. And uh, they are basically uh, doing other types of analysis, population analysis, because as I told you, most of, like, we have a, a high percentage of the active cells that are non spatially modulated. And we want to see whether in this type of cell we could also detect some sorts of distance coding. We have another collaboration with uh, Remy Monasson and his postdoc Massimiliano Tripa, and they are doing the same type of uh, population analysis. Also, all team members for the support and the very interesting discussion, my funding and the mice. And these are actually the, the real picture. Thanks a lot for your attention. Okay, thank you, Julie. Uh, it was a great talk. Thank you for the great introduction and the results. Uh, do people have some questions? Yeah. Okay, the, the time people have question, I have, of course, uh, some question, Julie. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. You, you can let your screen, you can share, continue to share your screen if you want. Um, my question is about uh, um, the input from antonial cortex to the play cell. Uh, so far, um, when the animal has to use object or not to use object, do you think the input from antonial cortex is useful? I mean, is it useful for both distance or position coding? What do you think? I mean, here we were in a condition that is very like the distance coding that we have in the track with ob object. I mean, it's much better in the track with ob object. So we really uh, direct our focus on this one because this condition co coding was uh, very good. And the distance coding is affected by medial septum in inactivation. So I think that grid cells are very important for that. The position coding seems not, is actually better than the medial septum inactivation. So, I, I mean, I don't, based on what we have, I don't think that the grid cells are essential to do, their, uh, to, to do this type of position coding. And do you have any idea of what grid cells do during this task? Yeah, that's, a, that's a, a very good question. So we have, there is already some uh, studies from uh, the Giacomo lab. They have shown that in it fixed mice, so running actually in tracks that are very similar to our, you have in the MEC cells that um, are distance tuned. So they have field uh, that is uh, at, the same, uh, at the same distance. So I'm talking about that because it's, it's in virtual reality, but of course there is also your results, like in the, in the circular uh, 
in the circular maze, but that was in, in Watts and uh, in, in real environment. And actually in the Giacomo paper, that was quite interesting because she suggests that not all of the grid cells uh, are like some, like most of the distance tuned cells are grid cells, but you have some grid cells that are not tuned like that to, di as, like that to distance. So maybe, I mean, we know that you have two different types of grid cells, the pyramidal and the stellate one, and maybe there, there is some differences. Some one population might be more driven by path integration and the other one not. Okay. And a last question, the time people ask something. So um, it's about bidirectional play cell and unidirectional play cell. Do you think there are two different networks and you can record? Uh, so I mean, you can record simultaneously both. Uh, they are depending of what the animal is doing. I mean, maybe the animal is using some strategy, spatial strategy, and for some trial, they are all unidirectional or in other trial because the animal yes. uses another strategy, they are bidirectional cell. Usually in the recording session, all of them, we have both. So when they are simultaneously recorded, we have both bidirectional and unidirectional cells. So I don't think it's two different network. I mean, if your question is related to deep and superficial, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I mean, we checked for that. And actually, you have as much deep and uh, superficial in the unidirectional that in the bidirectional. So, so that, that's not explaining that. I, I don't think that it's two network, the unidirectional and the bidirectional things. OK. <clears throat> So thank you, uh, Pierre-Yves, but mostly Julie, uh, Florence, and Manon. Uh, it was very interesting. And uh, we didn't have uh, much question from the audience, but uh, maybe it was a, a bit complicated uh, subject. However, this is... Uh, <laughs> The end of. I hope they are not sleeping. <laughs> no, we hope not. Okay, so thank you for your participation. This is the end of the Neurobina. And um, it will be the last Neurobina of the year. So uh, we should meet again uh, maybe on the uh, next year. Uh, uh, next. Um, university year. Yes, they are awake. We have uh, <laughs> Yeah, chat. but that, that, that's my team director. That doesn't count. <laughs> 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 Thanks, Jerome. <laughs> yes, so this is it. Thank you again. And uh, we hope to see you many uh, for the next Neurobinar, uh, probably next year. Thank you again and bye-bye. Thanks a lot. Bye. 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 Bye-bye.